My talk today is Bacteria to Biosphere. Gaia is symbiosis seen from space. As a geographer, I'm interested in the interaction between humans and the natural world. Geographers have traditionally limited their studies to a temporal scale of centuries. However, my particular interest is evolution, which is measured at the temporal scales of geologic or deep time that range from ages to eons. From this temporal perspective, there is also a need to consider cycles at scales from tens of millions of years between extinction events to cycles of metabolism within cells that take a fraction of a millisecond. Darwin's On the Origin of Species and its so-called modern synthesis with Mendel's genetics provided the neo-Darwinist context in which scientists, artists, and writers have done their work. Unfortunately, this neo-Darwinist view of life and evolution is fundamentally outdated. This worldview models life as a structured hierarchy rather than a dynamic system, and it envisions evolution as a linear bifurcating process rather than an integrated interaction, a network, between myriads of life forms inhabiting the planet. This anthropocentric vision assumes that Homo sapiens, or in the gene-centered view, the human genome, is the pinnacle of the evolutionary process. It accepts anthropocentric descriptions, in particular competition, as the exclusive strategy for survival. This current worldview sensibility is captured in this line from the Big History Project under the heading what a difference humans make. Quote, In a time-lapse movie of the history of Earth, all the action takes place in the final split second. Unquote. I will argue that we have not sufficiently conceived of either the spatial or temporal scales upon which the main action of evolution and of biotic interconnection within nature take place. We have not appreciated the integral roles that the microcosmos, deep time, Earth within the solar system, and cycles of extinction have played in shaping life and its evolution. As Lynn Margulis said, we share a species-specific arrogance. Implicitly, most of us believe that our species is the standard by which all other life, extinct and extent, is measured and that the single greatest division of life on Earth is between us and everything else. Contradicting our assumed exceptionalism, it is a difference in cell type that is, in fact, the single greatest division of life on Earth. The vast majority of life, 99% of which is unicellular, either bacteria, prokaryotes, or protists, organisms with nuclei and other organelles, eukaryotes. For the first 2,000 million years of life on Earth, there were no eukaryotes. During that time, bacteria evolved the entire repertoire of metabolism, the real action in evolution. To quote Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan, Bacteria invented all of life's essential miniaturized chemical systems. Fermentation, photosynthesis, oxygen breathing, and the removal of nitrogen gas from the air. Achievements that so far humanity has not approached. Unquote. Metabolism is the essential flow of matter and energy through cells to build and maintain their structures and functions. The essentials for metabolism are a source of energy, a source of electrons, a source of carbon, and a terminal electron acceptor. It is the primary producers, the chemo and photolithoautotrophic bacteria, or those bacteria as symbionts within cells who are able to use sunlight, rock, air, and water to produce the organic molecules on which the rest of life, the heterotrophs like us, depend. Life on Earth is radically interdependent, 
and continues to evolve into highly integrated communities. These communities exist in the billions of trillions in the microcosmos, and those communities nest inside fewer larger communities as scales increase through niches, habitats, ecosystems, 882 ecozones, 14 biomes, to one biosphere. Symbiosis and symbiogenesis occur across the succession of nested communities. Symbiosis is ecological. It is defined as a physical association between organisms of at least two different taxa that endures for most of the life of at least one of them. In cases where symbiosis leads to evolutionary change, such as new behaviors, new structures, new tissues, new organs, new species, or higher taxa, then symbiogenesis has been demonstrated. Symbiogenesis often takes great spans of geologic time, but it has been documented in the laboratory, and in nature it happens in a swallow. That is, when one organism or symbiont ingests but does not digest another organism. Instead, that ingested organism or symbiont forms an endosymbiosis. It is said that every scientific idea passes through three stages. First, it is ignored or ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed, claimed to be of only minor importance or said to be out of date. And third, it is accepted as self-evident. We knew it all along. When symbiogeneticist and evolutionist Lynn Margulis proposed that mitochondria, the energy-producing and oxygen-respiring organelles of eukaryotic cells and chloroplasts, the photosynthesizing organelles of algae and plants, had once been free-living bacteria rather than the result of gradual mutation, her paper was rejected by over a dozen peer-reviewed journals. When On the Origin of Mitosing Cells was finally reviewed and published, Margulis and her idea were ridiculed and violently opposed for a decade. When technology and research provided undeniable proof of her theory, symbiogenesis was begrudgingly allowed into biological texts. However, neo-Darwinist evolutionary biologists, such as Richard Dawkins, continued to assert that the role played by symbiogenesis, while important, had been rare and occurred millions of years ago. That remained the status quo in evolution and in the life sciences until 2011, when James A. Shapiro, a molecular geneticist from the University of Chicago, published Evolution, a View from the 21st Century, a comprehensive and detailed analysis of DNA sequence data that provided evidence of ongoing processes, such as symbiogenesis, horizontal gene transfer, interspecific hybridization, whole genome duplications, and movement of mobile genetic elements. These processes are not neo-Darwinian because they are biologically and biochemically mediated by cells and not by random accidents. They generate major genome changes, often affecting many characters. They can be rapid and they occur before testing by natural selection. In late 2012, a symbiotic view of life, we have never been individuals, was published in the Quarterly Review of Biology. I quote, Animals cannot be considered individuals by anatomical or physiological criteria because a diversity of symbionts are present and functional in completing metabolic pathways and serving other physiologic functions. Similarly, those new studies have shown that animal development is incomplete without symbionts. Symbionts also constitute a second mode of genetic inheritance, providing selectable genetic variation for natural selection. The immune system also develops in part in dialogue with symbionts and thereby functions as a mechanism for integrating microbes into the animal cell community." Unquote. 
in early 2013, Animals in a Bacterial World, a New Imperative for the Life Sciences, appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, United States of America. I quote, The ecosystem that is the individual animal and its many microbial communities, the hollow biont, does not occur in isolation, but is nested within communities of other organisms that in turn coexist in and influence successively larger neighborhoods comprising ever more complex assemblages of microbes, fungi, plants, and animals. The examples come from animal-bacterial interactions, as described here, and also from relationships between and among viruses, archaea, protists, plants, and fungi. These new data are demanding a re-examination of the very concepts of what constitutes a genome, a population, an environment, or an organism. Similarly, features once considered exceptional, such as symbiosis, are now recognized as likely the rule." Unquote. A radical new synthesis is taking shape. Integrative or symbiotic biology and the third way of evolution. This paradigm shift became of note in science in 2014 with headlines about microbiomes and the surprising new findings about the fact that we humans are ecosystems or communities. We are hollow biomes, not individuals. Bacteria outnumber our eukaryotic cells 10 to 1. As Scott Gilbert puts it, we are all lichens. The Russian, Boris Kozlpilyansky, had worked out much of the detail of symbiogenesis in the 1920s that Lynn Margulis would later rework in the 1960s. The Russian Vladimir Vernadsky had described in his 1926 book, The Biosphere, the effects of living matter that James Lovelock would also discover and advocate and on which Lynn Margulis would collaborate as the Gaia hypothesis. Gaia is a theory of the Earth within the solar system. Gaia is a complex, far from equilibrium, thermodynamic system. In such systems, the move toward order tends to be distributed over all of the components of the system. The more this is the case, the more robust or resilient the system is likely to be. Gaia is a huge system but the vast majority of active components are single-celled organisms, rather than organisms that are big like us. Gaia also includes in the crust of the Earth all the bygone biospheres, the solar energy stored by life, the propagules and dormant life forms that can survive for decades, centuries, or longer, and below polar ice, in caves and other isolated refugia, life is protected for millennia. Systems produce emergent properties from their dynamics, performance, interaction, or context that are more than the sum of their parts. The Gaia hypothesis has been critiqued, debated, modeled, researched, revised, and expanded over the past 46 years, becoming Gaia theory. It is stated here with its four major emergent properties. Over 30 million types of extant organisms, descendant from common ancestors and embedded in the biosphere, that directly and indirectly interact with one another and with the environment's chemical constituents, form a homeoretic, biotic planetary regulatory system within physical limits. They produce and remove gases, ions, metals, and organic compounds through their metabolism, growth, and reproduction. These interactions in aqueous solution led to the modulation of the Earth's surface temperature, acidity, alkalinity, and the chemically reactive gases of the atmosphere and hydrosphere for over 3,200 million years. Gaia is the only scientific explanation for the survival of life on Earth 
given 4,500 million years of stellar evolution and an estimated 25 to 30 percent increase in solar radiation. Radical changes in redox states, such as the Great Oxidation Event, geologically lengthy periods of stasis through perturbations, large and small, fast and slow, hot and cold, and repeated cycles of mass extinction. The alternate explanation is that survival of life is the result of random accidents. We are in the midst of a mass extinction. What prediction can we make from the Gaian perspective? The scale of evidence comes from the microcosmos, but this is the depth to which these large-scale phenomena reach. Foraminifera, or forams for short, are single-celled amoeboid protists that form shells called tests. Forams have left an incomparable fossil record, so complete that they are used as index fossils to divide periods of time over the past 570 million years. Paleobiologist Martin Brazier, an expert on forams, found that their test revealed that they repeatedly evolved species that housed photosynthesizing algal, diatom, and dinoflagellate symbionts within increasingly large and more elaborate tests over millions of years between extinction events. Quoting Brazier, Using the same rules for tracing the evolution of foram symbioses through deep time, we can discover that these great cycles from calamity to calm and back to calamity again have taken place numerous times over the last 300 million years. And one or more of these cycles can be traced within no less than 40 separate lineages. Not only that, but they have always followed the same tragic trajectory. They have always resulted in the total collapse of symbiotic forms. It is an alarming pattern. Indeed, it is so regular, it is almost a prophecy." Unquote. Brazier notes that in this pattern there is nagging evidence that extinctions do not neatly coincide with the arrival of an asteroid, a volcanic eruption, methane burp, or other presumed cause. Instead, the cause is what Brazier calls the Sphinx within. To quote Brazier, In the case of ecosystems, long periods of stability and hence of predictable conditions encourage ever greater efficiency and specialization, perhaps to the point where there is almost no slack left in the system. Every resource is shared and channeled, and the system is exquisitely dependent on this finely tuned state. But when conditions change, there is nowhere left to run. Specialists become extinct. Maximum efficiency proves fatal. Looked at in this way, it may be unsafe to say that Darwinian natural selection of species is truly about the survival of the fittest, that is, if we take fittest to mean the most efficient. So in the fullness of time, catastrophic collapse within any complex and highly structured system seems an almost inevitable outcome, including extinctions of both cellular organisms and human societies." Unquote. Big historians use time-lapse to speed through deep time because their take is that it's the Big Bang, the Boring Billions, and then us. The neo-Darwinists take the life out of biology, they forget the first 2,700 million years, and show a cartoon about DNA making robot vehicles, animals, and then us. A Gaian history of life on Earth would require a film series. At least eight films, one for every 400 million years or so. You certainly would not want to miss the first seven. That is where trillions of little but critical things happen 
that taken together make some of the big plot twists understandable. How else are you going to understand the two scales of natural selection? The everyday check on fecundity and the longer cyclical check on complexity. What can we predict about the extinction event that we are in the midst of right now? Spoiler alert, life on Earth doesn't end, although it does for things big like us.